everyone, this is X O'Connor, and you are listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This week, we are going to be sharing with you a professional songwriting panel that took place live at our most recent songwriting retreat, Secret Event. This is a panel of all-star songwriters, including Bruce Wallace, Marty Dodson, Ben Calhoun, and Tony Wood, who have countless number ones and cuts with artists such as Dirks Bentley, Trace Atkins, Colton Dixon, Francesca Battistelli, Mandisa, Building 429, Seventh Time Down, and Citizen Way, just to name a few. Now, one thing that we really love about these secret events are that they provide a very intimate setting for people to interact and build relationships. And that is what you're going to get a taste of here in this episode. These writers sat down and opened themselves up to our attendees and gave them real insight into what it took to get where they are now, the problems that they still face, even with the enormous amount of experience that they have behind them. And most importantly, traits, habits, and mindsets that all songwriters should be developing regardless of skill level to help them set themselves up for success and to help them open doors to relationships that could really create a solid foundation to build a songwriting career upon. I don't want to give too much more away. This is definitely an episode any music lover will take copious amounts of new knowledge away from. So if you're interested in possibly discovering hints of how you could get involved in one of these secret events, and to keep up with absolutely everything going on in the Full Circle Music world, find us on Instagram at Official FC Music. I'm going to leave you guys alone now. Enough of my chatting. Let's dive into this episode taken live from our songwriting retreat, Secret Event. Hey, this is Seth Mosley. We're here at the Full Circle Academy Secret Event Songwriters Retreat here with a live studio audience. Woo! And we got here with us today a panel of the hit songwriters. We've got, let's just go down the line and why don't you introduce yourself and just don't be humble. Just like if you've had 40 number ones, say so. <laughs> Otherwise, I will. All right. <laughs> I'm Tony Wood, staff writer for Word Music here in town. This is my 26th year as a staff writer. 29 number ones, a lot of, a lot of records and songs Ooh. that I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of. Good morning, guys. My name is Marty Dotson. I am a staff writer for BMG Chrysalis here in Nashville. I've been writing as a staff writer since 2009 for different companies, and I also have a background as an artist. I was signed to Universal Republic, and now I'm just writing. And I do not have 29 number ones. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Calhoun. I sing for a band called Citizen Way. Uh, I have two number ones. Well, I've never said that before. Yeah. It feels weird, but... Yeah. Seth told me to do it. So uh, my first one is actually right there that yes. Seth produced himself. Yeah. And my brother and I wrote that song. And we have one currently on the charts right now called Bulletproof. And yay. Yeah. I uh, love being a part of this full circle family. It's good to be back. I work out to your song, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's in we heavy see rotation. The gym and, on yep. our workout class. Oh, yeah. So. It's on there. Yeah. Yeah. We love it. Love it. It's a good workout tune. And uh, I'm Bruce Wallace. I've been writing professionally for uh, about 10 years, 11 years, I don't know. And I'm the king of album cuts. I've got a million of them. <laughs> I recently had a number one in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Down under by a lot of Vegemite. Um, <laughs> but I'm a multi-genre songwriter. I mean, I do a lot of country. I write with a lot of like uh, bands and duos and trios and groups and singles and things and tattooed guys to like, I want to be the next Taylor Swift and <laughs> or we're aggressive hard rock, you know, it doesn't matter. That's what I do. And it's, and it's, just, like, it's not Bruce Willis, right? <laughs> no, if anybody asks me to do another Die Hard movie, I'm going off on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so, enough. I've had enough. <laughs> the amount of weight I got to put on. We're just going to start going down the line. But number one is, how did you get into the industry and get a publishing deal? We'll just go down the line. How did you get in the industry and get a publishing deal? I'd gotten feedback before moving to Nashville on some songs that I'd sent in to publishers back at a time when you could get a letter back in the mail. Haha, <laughs> doesn't happen anymore. And they kind of affirmed that the lyrics were a little better than the music. 
they weren't saying much nice about it, but there was a little bit of a compliment down in there that I kind of had to dig out. And so I really had stopped writing music and just focusing on the lyric part. When I came to town, I went to a conference that ASCAP was putting on. And it was great and encouraging and terrifying also because in that one of the writers said that like the hardest meeting to get with a publisher in Nashville is not the first meeting. The hardest meeting to get is the second meeting. And it just, it terrified me because I'm, I'm an introvert to the core. So the thought of walking up, introducing yourself, going, hey, I'm Tony and you need to meet me because uh, it's just against everything in me. But I knew at some point there's going to have to be this moment of introduction. I called up one of the guys who worked at ASCAP, who had put the conference on. And I go, hey, would you ever take a meeting? Would you look at some lyrics that I'm writing at this point? Not even whole songs, just kind of, he decided to take the meeting and I walked in and I put three pieces of paper on his desk with words on them that I thought somebody could sit at the piano and sing this. I think the cadence is right. I think the rhythm, the rhymes are all in place and and stood there trying not to twitch, trying not to move while he, while he reads them. And he read them and looked up and said, I know some people you need to meet, get in the car. And took me around to about four publishers at that point. Okay, true story. He said, you know, I know some people you need to meet. And I said, give me a minute. And I went to the bathroom and I cried because I should shut the stall because it, it terrified me and it scared me. And it was everything I, I had dreamed happening. And it, it was kind of happening. It just, it was overwhelming. So I pull myself together and then go back and get in the car. And he takes me around, introduces me to four publishers. And three of them were pretty firmly, no, thank you. And one of the guys said, maybe you should start hanging out here. Let me see if I can get some of my guys to write with you. And that was kind of the beginning of the opening door. I hung out there as much as I could. And about six or eight months after that, he offered me my first staff deal. Great. Marty? All right. Um, I started out as an artist. And all I ever wanted to do was to be an artist that wrote my own songs. I didn't know you could be a songwriter. My manager sent me to Nashville to write with somebody. And I was like, so what do you guys do? And they were like, the, this. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, like, <laughs> you don't have to like live in a van or <laughs> anything. So I was in this band. I had a publishing company that did admin on our stuff, which means they were the ones that kind of collected the money. Our manager had our publishing at that time. When that band broke up, that company signed me as a staff writer for them because I had written some things that I was writing for my records, but they got placed with other artists. So that's when I kind of figured out, oh, like this is something I could do and it doesn't just have to be about me. Because the cool thing about that was I had been writing for myself and then those songs got placed elsewhere. So I knew that I could do my thing still, but have other people cut it. So that's kind of how I ended up where I am. Yeah. And the name of the band? My band was called Saving Jane. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. I was much like... Both of you guys, Marty and Tony and Bruce, I'm sure too, just like scared to go out there and put yourself out there. You know, that dream that is so like fragile that if you talk about it, you know, it'll break. And I remember one of the best pieces of advice I ever received was from one of my heroes. He's in Christian music, Joel Hansen of a band called PFR. And I had stalked him. I booked him for a show with Switchfoot at my college at, in Chicago at Judson. And, and I said, can you, you know, produce some songs for us? He said, show me some of your songs. And I think I probably sent him 30 songs, like demoed <laughs> versions on GarageBand, you know, with music and stuff like that. And so it was my, you know, I'd done records up to that point, but these were demos and stuff. And he's like, you know, I see a lot of potential, but these just aren't quite good enough yet. Can you give me some better songs? And I said, yes, I can. You know, and I, because at that point it was, I knew what not to do. It was such a wonderful, like breath of fresh air. And so I went back to the drawing board and wrote a bunch of other songs, ones that you'll never hear of. You know, you can find them on YouTube, but it was that moment for me where it was like, oh, so this is what not to do. Oh, gotcha. It was, it was like, you know, Edison coming up with 700, you know, reasons or ways of not to do the light bulb. Mm. Same idea. And so when finally the light bulb hit was when I realized, oh, I really need to go study lyrics and songwriting in a way I've never had before. And so I came back with him. He's like, you got it. Let's go. And it's amazing how fast it goes once you find the one song or group of songs that you've been challenged to write. And for me, that was good rejection and good 
you know, no's that led me to finally getting a yes. And so, and then it led to us getting signed. We got, I wrote a song called Should Have Been Me. We got signed to one song. It did well on radio. And then we did the rest of the song. Seth produced that whole record. It was a dream come true. And I was literally just thanking the Lord every way. I remember that moment in the bathroom too, you know, where you just, you know, either the tears come or you laugh or you just sit there silent in awe of what the Lord has done. And for me, that's exactly what happened to me too. Yeah. I remember the first time that he came over to record that song, I was confused why he was in the bathroom so much. <laughs> but, but now I know. Wasn't a bladder. It was not a bladder. <laughs> nice. Bruce? When I moved to Nashville, I didn't move to Nashville to be a songwriter. I, I moved here in 1987. I moved here to be a guitar player. All I wanted to do was get on a tour bus and ride around. I wanted to play arenas and amphitheaters and do big shows. And it took me about a year and a half. I made friends and whatever, blah, blah, blah. One thing to led to another. And 17 years later, I'd done that. I'd played, played everywhere in the world and America and everywhere and with a different artists, a slew of different artists. So I made a decision to change it up. And I was writing a lot of songs with one particular guy. We decided to hire an independent song plugger to plug our songs because neither one of us had publishing deals. And there are some people, you know, pluggers at the time. I mean, there's pluggers that weren't associated with a company that could charge you either go percentages, you know, or something. Or, you know, we found a woman named Tammy Brown who was doing a per pitch charge. She would charge us, she would give us a detailed outline. And we really lost Tammy recently, last, last week. But so she was pitching for us and her and I became friends. And then she called me one day and said, I'm, I got a job with Olay, this company, and I can't pitch your songs anymore. But I've, entered, I've told them about you. You should come in and have a meeting with them. So I did. And one thing led to another. I met Ron Kitchener and Denny Carr and Shane Barrett. And then Ron Kitchener signed me to a thing. And, and I was with them for almost 10 years. And now I'm the CEO of Bruce Wallace Enterprises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but I got in through that way, through working with somebody who didn't have a job. She was just new people. And then she got a job, ended up getting a job and brought me in. So that's that's how I got into a pub deal. Yeah, that's good. You, you kind of jokingly said you're the CEO of Bruce Wallace Enterprises, but I think he hits on a really good point because, Shelly, you're, you're the CEO of Shelly Head Enterprises. David, you're the CEO of David Bullock Enterprises. You, you really are, even as a songwriter, you're your own brand and you're your, your own and, company. And nobody's really going to work harder than you. Nobody's going to work harder than you. Yep. So I'm actually glad that you said that. Mm -hmm. So second question that our group had is, how do you get through writer's block? Just keep writing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've shown up, I mean, I used to write like a ton, but I'd be like on a third co-write on a Friday after I written doubles all week and be burned out and not have anything and just go. And whenever I'd be like really burned out, that's when sometimes great stuff happened. Mm. I'd be fresh as a daisy on a Monday morning and struggle. Mm. And I'd just keep saying stuff. Just keep saying it. Just mm. like if it's not sticking, just keep going and just talk it out. Because everything is a song, you know? Yeah. The songs are all over the place. I think a part of it too is just Good. keeping a notebook full of a bunch of ideas. Some days you, you drive in to the right and there's this thing that's happened over the weekend or there's something God's teaching, something from the sermon. It's just, man, it's right there. You can't wait to wrestle it. And some weeks it just doesn't happen. So you just start flipping through titles and pieces and, and keep a lot of those. I, I found too, through the years that sometimes just changing it up in, in some kind of way, coming at it different, maybe writing someplace different. I got to a point of, of taking vacations and going, I'm not going to write. I am not going to write this week. Mm -hmm. And I have absolutely written some of my favorite things during those times when I said, I'm not going to write. It just, I don't know how that happens, why that happens, but it, but it just does. Whether it's someplace at the beach or sitting somewhere in a, in a hotel room, it's like, well, there it is. Switching yeah. to right. Yeah, it just, it does something. Yeah, that's good. I think for me, like in particular, I'm gentle on myself. I don't beat myself up when those things happen. And I try not to get angry with myself because I think lots of creative people are really, really self-critical. And I think we get enough of that from outside forces. So just try to take it easy. I like other creative pursuits. Sometimes that'll help me. Like I'll, you know, restore furniture, do stuff like that. Those are things that I do it the way I want it. And no one can tell me it's wrong because it's going in my house. So it's like one of those <laughs> things that it's a different way to be creative. And sometimes it helps to open other channels up. So. 
all of these things, I think probably at some point we all do in some way, shape or form. There's just a ton of ways to be creative. I always just try to board the train of whatever's moving. Especially if you're in the room with other people, if they're ex- excited about something, run with that. You know, I think the artist usually knows where to go in a feeling way, you know, so just help them. It's like a bunch of clay, just help them mold it into something. I love coming in and learning different instruments. Like I'll purposely write an instrument that I'm not comfortable with. Like uh, in my studio now is a dulcimer and it's, I have to I always have to tune it, re- you know, cause it goes out of tune, but I'll force myself to do different chords or I have old, you know, guitars that are only good for one thing, like a baritone electric telly, you know, it does one thing, but I'll try to do, instead of trying to normal on a electric, I'll just try to put a capo on it and see if I can get new sounds. It's just being creative, ride the creative train. If your brain is going somewhere creatively, then just run with it and be okay not knowing where it's going. Sometimes I will not write lyrics purposely until the music's done. And then I'll force myself to fit into that box, that three and a half minute pop song. It's just a track. And then you'll sit and you'll just be sitting around walking. I'll run a lot. You know, I run past Seth's house all the time thinking and writing of songs, you know, and Mm -hmm. one of my, some of my favorite songs have come from just not, not worrying about it. I know that there's another song that's going to come. I've had to literally just go, you know what? It's going to come. They never don't come. I'm just going to go do life and enjoy it. Be with my kids, hang out with my friends. And they automatic, like I'll be walking to get something to eat. And all of a sudden it's boom, there it is. And I love also like writing songs on top of songs. Like literally put it in your logic, your session or Pro Tools, and then just literally write a new set of lyrics on top of a Justin Bieber song. And then you go back and you put the track underneath it. It's a fabulous, it's already there. The, the tempo's there, the key, you might like it. It's just an easy way. I'm going into a session with Seth in a few weeks and I have four or five ideas that are on my phone or that I've already started. And you just, you go, you throw them out until somebody goes, that one. Yeah. And then you're right. off to the races. It's amazing how fast it goes. It's fun too. So stick with the creative yeah, train. You know, dulcimers are good kindling for a campfire. <laughs> <laughs> So true. A lot of wood there. <laughs> I love that phrase of being the board, whatever train's moving. Because I think there are a number of days where I'll still have just some hours and going to work on a lyric by myself. And I think if, if you set three pieces out on the table and say, I'm not going to put more than 10 minutes into one of them, if it's not happening, it'll start happening with one of them. You yeah, just, totally. the, the, where you're not working, you just kind of catch wind and yeah. it's moving. And yeah. ah, then you're off to the races at yeah. that point. Yeah. I liked your comment to the artist. You're writing with an artist, which I do all the time. They'll show you. Yeah. It'll come out. Yeah. Like their sensitivities, their who they are as a person. I always yeah. ask a lot of questions, like yeah. the whole thing, just who they are as a person, and it'll it'll come out. Yeah, it really yeah. does. I love this next question that you all wrote. How often and what length of time are you writing per week? Or along with that, do you have a quota with your publishing deal? And this gets into something that a lot of us as, you know, up and coming amateur writers really don't quite understand the volume of what a pro writer does. So I'd love for you guys just to answer that. I can jump on both of those. I typically book myself or my publisher books me five days a week and inevitably one or two of those will cancel. So I know at least that way I'm getting probably three writes in that week. Normally go in 10, 30, 11 and am writing until... 2.33. I spend time outside of that looking for ideas or, you know, just on the weekends or at home or whatever. And then I do have a quota. I think mine is 15 songs and that means 15 total songs. So if I'm writing with, if the four of us are writing, that's a quarter of one song. So you got to do all of that, all of that math. But it's, I mean, I write a lot, so I've never come up short or even close to that, but that's kind of how it works for me. I asked this question to Marty and Bruce yesterday. It's kind of a form of this yesterday is how many songs would you say you write a year? And I think, Marty, you said something about like 200. Yeah, the last time I counted, which was probably year before last, I had turned in like 200. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Bruce won up there and he did 300 last year. (laughs) So, Uh, 297. 297. (laughs) We round out. There's probably three that I forgot about. Yeah. But I was going crazy though. I was like, for me, it worked out because I'm a single guy, no girlfriend. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> I might as well be in the office writing all day, you know? So, was, so that was how I, I didn't have a dog at the time, you know? And, and I mean, I was good. 
So, yeah. I mean, I'd write doubles. I'd write an 11 and a three every day, five days a week. And sometimes I'd do a triple. I'd, sometimes I'd, I'd get crazy with my friend Phil Barton and write on a Saturday or Sundays. And, but I was just, that was my social life. I turned it into the social life because I, I had all kinds of regular people I'd write with and, and I was constantly making new friends. So you just come in, I go, hey, how you doing? Come on in, let's write a song. It's in the afternoon. And the office is empty because nobody else is doing it. But I'm like, hey, I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> so let's do this. Yeah. So that's how I got those kind of numbers of songs. I was just doing it all the time. And, yeah. And I'm burned out. And I like going back through my voice memos and listening to songs. I go, yeah. man, there's that four month stretch in 2015 where I was really on. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. Man. There's a lot of good songs in this little stretch. And then there'll be a couple I'm going, no, 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 no. And then a couple months later, there's like another stretch where I go, wow, those songs are good. Yeah. So I don't know. Tony, what would you say? How, how much are you writing every week? Uh, five days a week. It's, for a long time, it was two sessions a day. So, I don't know. It feels like these days, some people booking a little bit later start time. Sometimes you, particularly if it's an artist, you'll open up the whole day to that. So three days a week with one session, two days a week with two sessions. And then whatever comes to me on my own after 10 o'clock at night. Staying up till about one o'clock still most nights, just working on just stuff, ideas, developing part of the way, maybe finish up a lyric, just scratching down whatever drops out late at night. Yeah, that's good. I always think of it, it's a lifestyle for me. So it, I think being an artist, my standards from the label, I guess, are really just a record every couple of years. So I guess that's what, 10 or 12 songs that I officially have to turn in. But for me, the itch does not get scratched for 10 to 12 songs every couple of years. There's too many creative moments in my brain that I want to be a part of. I try to honestly pick the most practical low-hanging fruit. Like if there's an artist that wants to write with me, I will say, show me your best verse in a chorus. I mean, that's what I did with Skyly. And show me your best stuff. And then let's jump off of that train and actually try to do a project. I feel like sometimes I write so many that are just orphaned children. Mm -hmm. They never have a life. And so I'm trying to always, you know, discipline myself to say, unless I can really put this somewhere, I'm not going to put my time and energy into it just yet. But I'm always having kind of, I think it's kind of just bullets in the magazine ready to go for the right target. And I sometimes the target is a certain artist or a certain time. And for me as an artist, I always have to think of, okay, one song at a time that actually works. And so for me, I, I'm always looking like, I have 25 behind every song that you hear that are like, maybe, maybe this for this artist on Thursday at noon while we're eating Cheetos, you know, whatever the, the feeling is, you just always have to be ready. So it's a lifestyle. Yeah. So Bruce is exactly like, I have my voice memo filled up with stuff. Tony is same thing. I'll, I'll wake up at two in the morning and finish something or just start something and forget about it. But the idea is that you just, you're exercising that muscle. And I love that you have, like, there's a standard you have to meet because that actually, yeah. there's so many great things that come out of you just literally showing up to work and doing it. Especially if you're with great people in the room because they will carry the load so much with you. And it's so much fun that way. Collaboration is great. Yeah. I'm going to double back to talking about standards. Like I said, my quote is 15 songs. That's not just... 15 songs. It's 15 songs that my publisher says, these are commercial. I can pitch these. So I can't just, you know, if I want out of this deal, just go write a bunch of crap and be like, here you go. So yeah, there are definitely wow. standards applied to that stuff too. Yeah, that's good. Where do you find inspiration? Pinterest. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, for songs? Sometimes, yeah. What you, so, I just search quotes on there and that'll give me totally. something to jump off of. Yeah. So this is, I want to... I want to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just casually massage them into something a little bit different. <laughs> I want to camp there for a bit because I am new to Pinterest. Wow. I just got a Pinterest account <laughs> this past week. So, what do you do? Do you just search like country music or what? Like, what's the process of Pinterest? When for I your... use that, I'm just looking at quotes and then see if they inspire something, you know, quotes about life, quotes about breakups, quotes about. So, you can whatever. search quotes yeah, about you can breakups, specific like things. And I don't do that all the time, but if I'm struggling or if I can't just come up with anything, time. yeah, just 80%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's just another way to illustrate that inspiration comes from everywhere. Sometimes this is not my strong suit. There are lots of people, maybe one of you guys can speak to this, that can just pick things out of conversations or someone says something and it sounds like a title. 
I'm not great at that. So sometimes I'll say something and somebody will be like, oh, we should write that. And I'm like, no, I said it. I should write it. I think it's just rating life. It's being, having the antenna on at all points. I mean, there's a blessing, I think, in the creative type, in the creative spirit of kind of only halfway paying attention to what's going on in front of us anyway. Now, it's a terrible person to be married to, but, <laughs> but we can turn it into a little cash every now and then. So, so there's, a, there's a payoff for, for the whole thing. I have learned that when my wife is talking to, be very focused and not, and not looking for song <laughs> ideas during that time. But any other conversation is incredibly fair game. And to not let, the, the trick is in the eyes to not let on that. Did you hear what they said? Because then you, you can go to anybody else. There's a great story I heard <laughs> years ago. Uh, the guys that wrote so many of the songs from Motown, a, a team, Holland Dozier Holland, one of the guys is having an affair with one of the secretaries at, at Motown Studios, and he's off on a lunchtime, and his wife comes to the studio looking for him, and they act like, oh, we don't know. And so she knows who he is, so she goes, he's beating on the door, and like the secretary goes out the window, and he opens the door, and she's like, she's like, how could you? How could you do this? You can't, you can't treat us this way. you got to stop this for our family. you got to stop. Just in the name of love, stop. And he goes, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then goes back to the conversation and goes and writes the song right? and that's that thing of just being on at all points to hear it mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I recently found a gold mine last year my parents who are 90 and 89 they moved into an assisted living home in, in our hometown in Oklahoma I've been going back and visiting them like more now like every I go for a couple of weeks about every quarter and and I stay with them in the home, and they have all these. In and my dad calls them inmates. <laughs> <laughs> and they have and they have this thing called story time, where they'll they'll bring up a topic. They'll be like, "Tell us, let's go around the room, and everybody tell us about this a, a favorite Christmas memory you have of being a child." Mm -hmm. And I'll be sitting there listening to these old folks tell stories, mm -hmm. and I'm just like. And I'm like getting my phone out. My dad's going like this. And he goes, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and my dad, he, he, my dad gives me these looks. He's going, mm, I see you over yep. there. And I'm going, like, no, I'm still not. I'm going to get that. What did she just say? Wow, wow, wow. And uh, I mean, I grabbed, a, I stole a song from the salutatorian at my niece's graduation recently. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I was, she said that, and I got my phone out. My brother goes, oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was like, everything's... And you know, another thing that hits me in circumstances I'll be in, I'll imagine, like, what song do I want to hear? Like, if I was... If this scenario that I'm in right now was a movie, what song would be playing? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm walking out of a scenario where I just met a new girl, you know? And we had a nice conversation, and I'm leaving, and I'm thinking, like, wow, should I... Should I call her? Should I, I don't know. Should I message her? What should I say? And I'm walking out of the restaurant or whatever. And what song plays, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes sound, soundtracks yeah. hit me like that and it'll give me a mood and I'll go, wow, that mood feels good. Let's do that. Or if I'm jogging, which I don't jog, but if I did jog, maybe it'd be Rocky. <laughs> maybe it's, I am the guy of the tiger. I don't know. Yeah. You know, like how you were talking about totally. walking down the sidewalk and yeah. the thing hit you. I can tell by the way I use my... <laughs> <laughs> maybe, so a, maybe a tempo. It's maybe so a tempo true. hits you. It it's is so everywhere. true. It's so true. So as we're wrapping up, how do you know if a song is good enough? And when do you know that it's finished? When people press repeat. <laughs> like Marty's touched on that. Beat yourself up about things. Yeah. Like there, it's like there's a million ways to say a lot of things, you know? You can... You can say goodbye, adios, see you later, sayonara, but maybe sayonara is good today. Yeah. I don't know. Just got to let go of it and move on. Mm -hmm. I trust the instincts of other people that I create yeah. with too. My co-writers, I'm real trusting of people that I work with in publishing relationships. If their gut is, hey, you need to look at that second verse again, I'll willingly go back to that as many times as it takes. There's sometimes in, in the moment I, that you, you think it's done. I tend to drag new songs that I've written into playlists just to, to ride around and listen to on weekends and not 
fully listened to, but just kind of halfway listened to. And sometimes, man, that stuff reveals itself just through that kind of passive listening that you go, ah, oh, you know what, that line, okay, that's not quite doing what I thought it was. Um, but then there's a time and a place for that, but that's a place I'm not going to obsess about too, because a real writer is always moving on to the new songs. It's good to look back, but if it doesn't reveal itself as, ah, oh, there's something really wrong here, let, let's go on to the next song. I trust my gut on that stuff. I'm a yeah. consumer of music. So if I want to hear it again, if I like it, I listen to myself oh. in regards to that. And that's another reason I co-write a lot because if the song's not that good, I blame my co-writers. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's so true. That's it's great. Go, that's I think I'm right by myself. Yeah. Nobody to blame. And I just try to have fun with it. If you're not having fun, then move on to something that does. And maybe if that song at that point was, like, I'm not trying to like, you know, work in a stressful mode. I'm trying to have fun with what we do, you know? So like, if it's not fun, move on. It might be fun with a different person in a different scenario on a different day with a different title of a song. You know, you just, you might have to just keep going. And to the next thing that, you know, back to the other question that finds the next little dose of inspiration. And if people are responding to it, that's awesome. But if you respond to it, that's the key. Music is therapy and writing is therapy for writers and you have to do it. Otherwise you will die in one way or another. So just keep going. doesn't matter if anybody listens to it or buys it. You have it in you. You want to try to get better and do it, you know, the best you can. Just don't stop. Keep going. Yeah. That's good. Well, we've had Tony Wood, Marty Dodds from Saving Jane, Ben Calhoun of Citizen Way and Bruce Wallace. Let's give a hand for our amazing panelists today. So this has been the Full Circle Music Show coming to you live from the Secret Event Songwriters Retreat. And once more, thank you to our live studio audience. Hey, this is X O'Connor, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jordan Salamone. We always love hearing from our listeners, so feel free to leave us a review in iTunes. Let us know what you think of the show. We're always looking for ways to make the show better and to bring you all the best content that we possibly can. Again, if you're looking for hints on how to possibly get involved in one of our secret events and to just fully immerse yourself in the world of full circle music, follow us on Instagram at official FC music. And one last thing before we go, we wanted to let you know that starting at the beginning of October, we're going to be trying another series of podcasts. We did the marketing one back in July and it worked out really great. This time we're going to be doing a new one focused solely on production. We're already lining up some insanely great guests. So producers, songwriters, artists, whoever, get ready because this series will be packed full with new information that will help anyone in any part of the music industry and at any skill level. So be on the lookout for it. October is going to be a very fun month. But thank you guys again for tuning in. We're looking forward to seeing you all again next week.